really significant uh, seminar. My name is Ju Chong Tam. I'm a professor at the Law School at Melbourne University and also director of the Electoral Regulation Research Network. Uh, it is very exciting to be able to chair this particular event. Uh, this event is part of a series of online uh, lectures uh, that's being organized by International Idea and the Friends. Um, and this is the second um, one in terms of the uh, series. And what we have in terms of the series and um, the lectures will actually occur on a fortnightly basis is that the next one will be by um, Therese Pierce Lamella, uh, speaking on a very topical issue on uh, special voting arrangements uh, between the convenience of voting and the integrity of elections. But before I move on to today's topic and, to, and to introduce the speaker, um, for those who came in a bit later, um, you'll notice on the bottom right hand of your panel that there actually are a series of polling questions that um, are relating to this particular topic. Uh, can I strongly encourage you to fill up these polling questions? Uh, they, they'll be very valuable in terms of uh, feedback for this particular event. And what will also occur is that uh, at the end of this particular lecture, there'll be um, uh, a set two of polling questions where, which also allows us to inform, us, inform ourselves in terms of the organizing of these events. Um, what we'll also have uh, in terms of questions uh, is actually through the course of this event, uh, after uh, Tom Daly has spoken, there'll be discrete questions that we'll like your feedback on. So do keep an eye out for them because there'll be one minute uh, uh, snap questions. So uh, they'll have to be answered very, very quickly. It is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, um, Associate Professor Tom Daly. Uh, Tom is really a veritable expert on democracy globally. Uh, he's also an associate professor at the uh, University of Melbourne and deputy director of the Melbourne School of Government. Now, Tom is a real dynamo. Uh, that's just his day job, right? Uh, alongside his day job, uh, Tom is the convener of uh, DemDEC a database and you see that um, the database uh, link is actually on the chat, uh, which Dem Deck, which actually is transformed to COVID Dem uh, in the pandemic. And an important event to just bring to your attention is that uh, Tom is co-organizing with Professor Wojciech Sadowski uh, of the forthcoming virtual global roundtable of the International Association of Constitutional Law. And that particular conference uh, picks up on a team, I think will be, we're all considered to be highly significant, the question of constitutional decay, breakdown and democracy. And you see the information, the chat together with the links. Now, Tom will speak for about um, 20 minutes or so. Yeah. And then we'll open up for questions and discussion. Now, in terms of questions, um, which you can put, uh, Right now, if you'd like to, and in fact, uh, thank you to, Gop uh, to Gopal from Nepal for kicking off the camaraderie in terms of this particular event. Um, put your questions in the chat, uh, address them to all so that we can have a nice, fluid, transparent and inclusive process of questions and discussion. And then what I'll do is that after Tom has spoken for 20 minutes, I'll, I'll put those questions to Tom and really look forward to actually uh, a robust discussion and really learning from all of you. So really, without any further ado, can I pass it on to you, Tom? Well, thank you, Ju Chong, uh, for that really fulsome introduction. Um, and thank you to International Idea and to Adi Aman for the invitation to join this great series. It's a really necessary series, really a worthwhile series. Um, and I'm delighted to have my my colleague, of course, Ju Chong, in the, in the chair. Um, so, I was asked to speak about, you know, this issue, how does distant and online election campaigning affect political freedoms? And um, there are a whole different ways we could slice this, but um, we wanted to focus on how the need for physical distancing during the pandemic has raised the need for innovative campaign methods um, to, be, to be developed by election candidates, um, given that they're under serious restraints um, and constraints 
Um, as regards conventional campaign methods, the usual rallies, public meetings, fundraising events are prohibited in many states, of course. Um, and, and so distant and online election campaigning can be seen as restrictive um, because of the barriers imposed, um, both physical and technological. Um, now, I have produced a paper for this talk, and I'm going to speak to it relatively closely, um, but I am going to add in a few extra observations here and there. Um, I also should say from the very outset that I really, really welcome um, the audience's input in terms of knowledge about the country experiences we're talking about, knowledge of other experiences not covered in the paper. Um, so really the paper, all it tries to do, it's a sort of initial preliminary exercise, trying to give an overview of key issues and discussion of selected case studies. Um, and what I wanted to do was to show through the case studies that it's possible to navigate these challenges imposed by the pandemic um, and achieve good outcomes uh, that support legitimate and democratic government. Um, but I also wanted to talk about how those good outcomes and those possibilities are dependent on a range of factors. And in a number of states, um, both the possibility of well-managed online campaigning and uh, legitimate democratic outcomes and a sort of uh, a legitimate electoral process um, is undermined by broader intensifying political trends um, that cut against the support of framework we need for informed and free and fair voting. Um, so it's really uh, aiming to give you an impressionistic picture of, of recent experiences across Asia and the Pacific. And uh, what I wanted to do with the paper was to start by framing uh, some of the issues in, in hopefully a helpful way. Um, so I started it by talking about the relationship between elections and political freedoms as a, as a starting issue. Um, then uh, key challenges that sort of any country is going to face when you have to deal with these constraints uh, imposed by the pandemic um, and a regional overview, short regional overview. But um, I wanted to give that broader regional context before discussing the case studies and the case studies are covering success stories or perceived success stories from South Korea and Mongolia um, concerning trends in Singapore and Indonesia. And I wanted to fit as well with a, a hopeful insight from Australia, um, from the, the local elections currently taking place here in Victoria in particular. Now, I should say from the outset, and, and Ju Chang mentioned it, that in this short presentation and the paper itself, I'm drawing heavily on the policy and academic analysis gathered through the COVID DEM project I launched in April 2020. And that project is aimed at charting the pandemic's impact on democracy worldwide. And it's part of this broader project on democratic decay and renewal. So COVID DEM is a free online database, as it says in the chat there, it provides access to over 2000 carefully curated items. Um, so it aims to make it easier for democracy analysts, policymakers, and the public to understand how the pandemic is reshaping our democracies. And, and COVID DEM itself is now a, a part of IDEA's um, fantastic global monitor of COVID 19's impact on democracy and human rights. And uh, I definitely uh, recommend looking at that uh, database, which is an even bigger undertaking. Um, uh, so so I'll move to the relationship between elections and political freedoms. And some of this is going to be completely obvious, um, but I thought it was necessary to just state some of the principles at play here, just so that we're clear on what we're talking about. Um, and I wanted to start with, you know, our general understandings of this relationship, even before we get the pandemic into the mix. And, you know, even at the best of times, in the best circumstances, running elections and running in elections as a candidate is a huge undertaking. That is absolutely has to be recognized. You know, it's got such democratic and political importance. 
It has enormous logistical complexity, especially the bigger the elections are, the bigger the state is, the more fraught the political context might be. Um, so there's no such thing as an easy election. Um, in terms of defining modern democracy, of course, elections are at the heart of it, but elections themselves don't equate to democracy in and of themselves. They're a necessary condition, but they're not a sufficient condition. We need more to have a true functioning democracy. So to have that true functioning democracy, we and a legitimate electoral process more specifically, we have to have at minimum adequate protection of core democratic rights, such as the freedoms of speech, assembly and association. And there also has to be, as I said in the paper, more broadly respect for the rule of law as the sort of supporting matrix uh, in which the elections take place and the entire campaign period. So I simplify this in the paper somewhat as um, an acceptance among the political classes that constraints on political power are not just acceptable, but desirable, um, that the average individual knows where they stand and what will happen if they break the law. And that includes electoral candidates, of course. Um, that those with political power are equally subject to the law um, and that the law is implied, uh, applied impartially and not used as a partisan tool against opponents or critics. And I'll be returning to that issue uh, in the context of Singapore and Indonesia. So um, ultimately, I sort of say in the paper, you know, where these criteria are not met, elections might be run with admirable efficiency or innovation, but they can't ultimately be deemed to be fully free and fair. And I think that's one of the sort of main takeaways I would want uh, to, to, to take from this discussion of that relationship between elections and political freedoms. Um, so taken within this broader context, um, you know, elections do remain the core mechanism reflecting what is democracy's ultimate promise, which is giving real power to the people. Um, and so it understandably, uh, elections do have this totemic importance as the ultimate accountability mechanism for government. So that possibility of voting out the government, selecting new representatives, whether it's the top tier government, local government, uh, state government, if you're in a federal system, um, and it's one of those key features, not the only feature and, and, and not, not the, the most important, perhaps, but it's one of those features that marks genuine democracies from undemocratic regimes that present uh, a democratic facade. Um, and sort of thinking about how elections work in general, as we all know, and once again, this seems very obvious, but it's useful to keep in mind is that the political atmosphere becomes highly charged during electoral camp campaigns. So, as I say in the paper, errors have higher stakes, outcomes are subject to even more intense scrutiny and contestation than usual. So, for candidates and for electoral uh, regulators and, and, and those organizing elections, you know, elections are a fraught time. It is a time where putting a foot wrong um, can really, really matter um, and, and, and where um, not dealing adequately with constraints or having constraints put in your way um, can really change the outcome um, for, for, for you. Um, so when you consider that as our issue when we don't even have a pandemic involved, when you throw in a global pandemic and all of the constraints that it puts in place, you know, we have what was already an enormously challenging context becomes, you know, even uh, more complex. You get all of these extra layers of complexity and difficulty. Um, and so you have these serious potential implications for the conduct and legitimacy of elections and for political freedoms more broadly. So from there, you know, Based on this survey of material that we had already gathered um, through the COVID Dem project, um, I started to put together a list of some of the key interrelated and often mutually reinforcing challenges that we face um, under the pandemic conditions when trying to 
uh, campaign or organize um, elections. And the first most obvious ones, I suppose, are the physical constraints placed on campaigners in reaching the public um, sort of preclude um, or at least limit the usual campaigning activities like rallies, public meetings, debates, in-person leafleting. And, you know, it's important to recall just how ingrained those activities are. These are how things have been done for a very long time. And it's difficult to move away from what has been done a very long time. Um, we also have campaigners technology skills. You know, it might not, not just be down to a willingness to embrace technology in order to uh, engage in distant and online campaigning, but you might also have disparities in knowledge of and access to online technologies, both among campaigners and the public. Um, moving from there, you have the same issue affecting regulators themselves. You might have disparities in knowledge uh, of, of, of certain online technologies and access to technologies uh, across different states when you compare them. But even within the same state, you might have in a federal state different levels of ability or access. Um, moving on down, you have the prospect of public disengagement as a result of the constraints placed um, by the pandemic on electoral campaigning. So um, in some case, this, cases, this might be the intensification of a pre-existing trend of disengagement and something to be very worried about already. And you don't want it to get any worse, of course. Um, on top of all of this, you have, in many cases, a degraded information landscape. So you have this dramatic impact of the pandemic on, on the media landscape in many states, especially local media. Um, and there's increasing talk about uh, deliberation deserts or discussion deserts um, in, in the sense that um, in some areas, local media especially has been so hard hit that the potential for a uh, discussion through simple local media, as has happened in previous election campaigns, has been seriously um, hit. Um, on top of that, we have uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, so you've the increasing prevalence of online misinformation um, that has intensified during the pandemic. So the WHO has called this the infodemic. You have just this increasing um, fake news, rumors, um, the scapegoating of minorities um, for regarding COVID uh, transmission and so on, um, which has really complicated the task for candidates of reaching voters. And you also have the problem of ensuring that the public vote on an informed basis. Big issue for electoral regulators and government and for the democratic system more broadly. Of course, we have the issue of some candidates being the sources of misinformation as well. And, uh, and, and that has to be uh, noted. On top of this, we have state censorship. So the excessive actions taken by some governments and officials to curb the growing misinformation about the pandemic in practice has simply expanded their powers to silence critics and curb scrutiny. Um, and then finally, we have worries about turnout. So in many cases, when you have this, you know, elections being run and campaigns being run in this much sort of more challenged and constrained environment, um, the potential, there's a potential for much lower turnout than in previous elections, which could really seriously affect the perceived legitimacy of the elections. Now, in the regional overview I, I, um, I provided in the paper, I just wanted to give a sense of, you know, the different contexts that different states are facing and just the sheer level of diversity across Asia and the Pacific when we're talking about this issue. And as I say in the paper, it's routine to say how diverse the region of Asia and the Pacific is, you know, regarding the size of states, the wide disparities in income levels, development, state capacity, and so on. And that has real implications for both pandemic preparedness and electoral preparedness. Um, and that diversity has been become even more pronounced during the COVID crisis because it's hit countries so unevenly. Um, so 
some states facing elections uh, this year had brought the virus under control largely before elections began. So that includes South Korea in April or New Zealand at the moment, um, or they had only registered a small number of cases. So including New Caledonia earlier this month um, for their referendum. Um, and a whole number of states have had to postpone elections due to the virus. So Sri Lanka's 25th of April elections were postponed twice and finally held on the 5th of August. Um, but the region as a whole, according to statistics from uh, IDEA itself, um, suggests that the region has bucked the global trend towards lower turnout in elections held during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, uh, it looks like turnout has been higher in, in states like South Korea, and I'm gonna be discussing that a little bit more below, um, Singapore, Mongolia, um, and turnout has only been slightly lower in some other states like Tajikistan this month, um, or the March local elections in um, Queensland here in Australia. Um, but of course, once again, the, the, the challenges being faced in organizing these elections, once again, differ very widely. So you have, you know, a, a, an enormous difference between a single by-election, as we've seen in Taiwan with the, the, the Kaohsiung mayoral by-election in August, to the National Assembly elections in South Korea with a population of 50 million people. We have local elections across a very large and populous state of 27, 270 million people, which is Indonesia in December. So these are all entailing different degrees of complexity, um, uh, different COVID contexts, different um, official capacity contexts. Um, but that makes it all the more important that we build um, our body of knowledge of best practice um, as more and more states undergo this process of reorganizing elections due to the pandemic. So I want to turn to quickly to our success stories before I then talk about some of the concerning trends. So the the real poster child of, as I put it in the paper, turning lemons into lemonade is South Korea. Um, because South Korea was, you know, one of the first states to organize national elections during the pandemic under COVID conditions with very relatively little guidance to draw on. So the state has been pretty rightly recognized internationally for its success in not only organizing full free and fair elections, um, on the 15th of April um, for its 300 seat National Assembly, but also for showing really considerable innovation and, and achieving a high turnout. So it was the highest electoral turnout since 1992 with 66% of eligible voters um, voting. And in the paper, I identify six main features of the South Korean approach um, to organizing its elections under COVID conditions. So the first is building trust. The National Election Commission issued an early statement reassuring the public that it would take measures to ensure safe voting. So getting out ahead of the concerns of voters. Second was ensuring transparency. So the commission communicated by a whole variety of traditional and online means throughout the campaign period so that people, both campaigners and the public could remain informed and know where they stood. Uh, the third is clear rules on what was not permitted for campaigners and what was permitted. So, for example, it was very clear that all in-person campaign activities were prohibited. And the fourth was innovation by campaigners themselves. So we saw candidates making this remarkable shift to digital and online technology, primarily by sharing video messages on social media platforms, using text messages and smartphone apps and even embracing augmented reality technology in some cases. Um, we also had fifth early voting. So this was a real saver in the South Korean context where they had permissive eligibility rules for early voting covering about one quarter of the population. And that had the double advantage of allowing more people to vote while also taking pressure off in-person polling stations. Um, and finally, there were clear and effective safety measures for in-person voting. So for those, um, those voting on the day, the commission issued a code of conduct for voters, which provided very detailed instructions and outlined actions, safeguards and precautions. So once again, voters were reassured that th their safety was being kept 
uh, in, 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 in mind and was being protected uh, in order for them to actually um, to uh, exercise their democratic right to vote. Um, but I think it's important here when no, recognizing the, the extraordinary success in the South Korean context to emphasize that at the time the elections were held, the state had successfully flattened the curve. Um, um, and also South Korea had benefited from a starting position of pretty high quality democratic governance, high state capacity, public servants adept with technology and extremely high internet access. So South Korea is among, if not the world leader with 95% um, internet access across the population. You also had the practical issue that, you know, the um, infections that had happened uh, in terms of the, the virus itself um, in February and March were in a specific area. And so it was easier to get um, the virus under control in advance of the elections. Um, I should say as well, it's the elections weren't perfect. So overseas residents in some countries weren't able to vote, for example, due to the suspension of election affairs at overseas embassy offices. Um, but it is a success story and it deserves to be recognized as such. Um, Mongolia too is broadly seen as a success story, but a lesser known one. Um, so among the, the parliamentary elections there took place on the 24th of June um, under fewer constraints than the Korean elections three months before um, because the state's virus suppression uh, strategies had been very successful um, at that point. So even today, there have only been uh, just over 300 cases and zero deaths. Um, so campaign rallies were permitted, um, in-person rallies, um, but those attending were required to sit two metres apart. Uh, there were 670 candidates in total running, including 208 independents. And um, the incumbent prime minister uh, from the Mongolian People's Party um, campaigned in person as well wearing a protective face shield. And, uh, and his party won a landslide victory with uh, about 45% of the vote. Um, and sort of mirroring the trend in South Korea, it seems that campaigners made much greater use of online camp campaigning tools. So even making use of social media influencers to get across the me core messages in their campaigns. And uh, election day reports suggest that social media was a buzz um, uh, with voters indicating that they had just voted, encouraging others to vote. Um, and there's been some suggestion that active use of social media presented an opportunity for a more level playing field for new and established candidates to connect with voters. Um, but it's important to note here, there's a big difference with Korea in the sense that internet access is only about 22% in Mongolia. So this suggests that perhaps social media played a more limited role, um, or perhaps it was limited to metropolitan areas. Um, but overall, it is a success story. Um, voter turnout was high at 73.6%. And I would really be interested to hear from anyone who has knowledge of the Mongolian case study um, for more detail, because there's only so much detail written up so far. Now, with that said, I just want to say a few few words about the the issues in Singapore and Indonesia before I, I, I before I wrap up. So, some governments um, have been careful to preserve, you know, the maximum of democratic functioning while effectively suppressing the virus. Um, you know, South Korea is a, a clear example, but in other states, the approach to, to elections and uh, increasing curbs on political freedoms are increasingly viewed as part of this wider pattern of repression that has intensified during the pandemic. And there has been talk globally, of course, about pandemic backsliding. Um, so Singapore had its parliamentary elections on the 10th of July um, and it banned in-person rallies, it embraced online rallies and it uh, uh, introduced innovations like special polling times for the elderly and so on. But the pandemic and the electoral uh, period, the campaign period, was uh, accompanied by a clampdown on criticism. So you see the government using this existing law um, for dealing with fake news, the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act, um, to remove critical views about the country's, uh, the government's uh, COVID response. 
Um, and you have similar reports in Indonesia with media organizations saying that, you know, news websites have been tagged with digital graffiti. You have critical articles being removed. And this really raises concerns about the context um, in which Indonesia's uh, local elections in December are going to be held, which is amplified by concerns about widespread vote buying by incumbents through social assistance funds for the pandemic. Um, and I'll end with a, a hopeful note from uh, uh, Ju Chang and, and my uh, home state. Um, one of the, the things that I, I really was worried about for Victoria's local elections was, and, and, and we, had, we had actually commissioned uh, a, a policy brief at the School of Government from um, the CEO of the civil society organization supporting local government um, about the threats to uh, the local elections due to COVID. And there were serious concerns about you know, the constraints placed on candidates due to lockdown, that the conditions would favor incumbents, um, that we would end up having fewer uh, female and minority um, candidates, and that diversity would actually go down in the coming uh, council um, elections. But actually, uh, to the surprise of many people, um, the we've seen an unprecedented according to some diversity of candidates. And this includes candidates from younger demographics, minorities and women, and some of course, uh, straddling across multiple categories. And there seems to be, you know, uh, a number of candidates are, are really spurred on by the challenges faced during COVID, but also once again, similar to Mongolia, using social media as a way of, of flattening or leveling that, that, that playing ground with incumbents and establishment politicians um, in a very sort of positive way from the viewpoint of uh, diversity and inclusion. So I'll leave it there, a note of hope, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks so much, Tom. That's really superb and really, um, you know, quite an insightful sort of concise uh, presentation of the issues at stake. Um, before I, start, I put some questions to Tom, can I just remind um, uh, the various participants to send their questions, um, and I made a mistake this with this, using the chat function, but addressing it to everyone. I think I made a mistake by saying to address it to attendees. If you send it to everyone, that'd be really fantastic. Um, the other just quick reminder is that there will be that those uh, snap polling questions appearing, uh, one minute polling questions, and again, strongly encourage you to answer them. We've had some some interesting questions, Tom, and um, I suppose the la the first one I put to you actually picks up on the last point you made about how that um, in fact this um, uh, development in terms of distant online campaigning could actually have a leveling effect. Mm -hmm. I suppose the flip side is to whether it could have the opposite effect. So we've had a um, question from uh, Gopal Krishna Siwakoti from Nepal and really referencing the Sri Lankan elections, but I think we can broaden it out, is really whether this particular development is could be a vector for an abuse of incumbency power. And if I could specify that question uh, with two prongs, I suppose for me thinking whether there could be abuse of incumbency power in the sense that the incumbent party or government has greater access to avenues of communication in the pandemic. And secondly, whether if there's a greater shift to online campaigning, whether the government has a greater capacity to interfere with uh, communications uh, um, engaging by other candidates or and parties. Yeah, absolutely. Really important questions. And it really comes back to that issue of what is the broader context in which the elections are being held, because you can't simply transplant the experience from South Korea and say, you know, we're going to do online rallies, we're going to make greater use of of uh, of smartphone apps and so on. Um, I mean, you can you can do your best on that side, but if the if the surrounding political context is focused on um, giving incumbents uh, an unfair advantage um, on, on closing down uh, free speech online, whether that's removing critical articles um, on, on opposition websites or on open access um, blogs, for example. Um, those are real, real um, concerns. And of course, the more online, um, the more um, 
you know, governments are going to, to engage in this type of behavior. Um, it's interesting from a comparative point of view, we've seen this being done um, in uh, countries that do seem to be traveling um, a very negative democratic path. So in Hungary, for example, um, the, the government set up, the public broadcaster set up a, um, a, a fake news um, fact checker website. And what it's actually being used for is to attack opposition politicians. And you can mm -hmm. see how those kinds, that type of mechanism could be easily mm -hmm. used during, during an election period um, mm -hmm. in a context where there is an ongoing concentration of power in the government, for example. And we see that happening in Sri Lanka, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think that is a very real concern. I think yeah. that the real concern as well about, um, you know, the closing down of temporary clo closure of apps, for example, we've seen this happening um, in various countries where, you know, um, Twitter gets taken down for a short time or Facebook is unavailable. And, and you can see how targeted um, closures at particular junctures, it might not even be, you know, for a very long period, but could really hammer opposition politicians, um, yep. you know, potential to get their 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 message out mm -hmm. and to have a, a level playing field. Yeah. It, it, it really prompts in my mind, I suppose, when we're thinking about the pandemic and the, the impact on democracy or elections more generally, I suppose, and I'm being uh, crude and caricatured in thinking about this, is that we can think about the pandemic and its impact as disruption, mm -hmm. right? So it takes the political system, the democracy system to a different path, or we can think about it in terms of path dependence. Mm -hmm. And I know the jury is so still out and it's all we need much more research and thinking and uh, about particular contexts. But I suppose just getting your thoughts about, you know, your sense, uh, impressionistic, you know, which one seems to have more credibility? Are we still looking at path dependence so that authoritarian states will result in more authoritarian outcomes as of a different variant, or are we looking at more in terms of disruption? For me, I think there is a very strong narrative of disruption, but for me, I think it's a path dependence issue. I think the really serious issues we're seeing arising during the pandemic are an intensification of existing trends. The pandemic hasn't caused them, the pandemic has simply accelerated them. And so if you have, for example, you know, a trend towards um, uh, closing down or suppressing opposition voices, even mm. if it's subtle, we've seen that harden. We've seen that sort of take a stronger shape uh, during the pandemic, partly because there is less international censure because everybody is so consumed with just suppressing the virus, dealing with this whole issue, um, but also because um, I, I, I call them in a, in a recent piece I wrote, I, I say some states are autocratic opportunists mm -hmm. and, and, and some, some governments have really pounced on yeah. the, the opening that the mm -hmm. pandemic has sort of has, has produced to, yeah. to do what they couldn't get away with during normal times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I th I think you know, path dependence is sectoral as well. If you have, for example, you know, a, a strong resistance in the the political culture or among political classes to yeah. embracing online technology, then th it's going to be very hard to make a shift quickly. You know, it's going to be very hard. In South Korea, there is much stronger acceptance, much more widespread acceptance of this sort of open source, open government. Sim yeah. Taiwan is the same, and and they have that that path dependence has sort of aided them, benefited them in uh, heading into the pandemic era. So it's it's intensified some good trends for them. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, I think it's a path dependence issue. Yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Um, a different kind of uh, question and from, sorry, I'm trying to find out who, who asked the question, but I'll ask put a question any, in any event. Is really whether you see any value in some kind of code of conduct um, regarding campaigning by part, political parties and candidates, given this pandemic context, 
and what role the electoral management body might have um, in brokering or bringing about a code of conduct of this kind. Yeah, I, I think there is value in this. So when you look at the South Korean context, I think when you're facing the potential for chaos and when you're facing such uncertainty, both on the side of campaigners and among the public, you know, what am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? Um, how am I going to vote? Am I going to be safe? One of the first things you want to do is to achieve some level of clarity. And anything that that pushes in that direction of greater clarity, I think is going to really is, is going to just add to, you know, the potential for well run elections. Um, and I think an election commission is the sort of ideal body to produce th that kind of code of conduct because it is designed to do this sort of thing. Um, mm. Of course, not every country has an election commission. Um, mm. And that's where sort of, you know, we've had issues like, uh, depends on the COVID context as well, how, how the commission is running, um, whether they're able to meet um, easily and so on to produce these kinds of materials that, that, that comes into it as well. COVID reaches into every area of, of what you're trying to do. Um, but mm. I think as well, if you have a well-considered code of conduct, it can be a useful tool potentially for opposition politicians to call out, um, you know, malpractice by incumbents. Um, and it could be a useful way of trying to tilt or the, the, the power back towards something that is closer to level, even though it can't just do it on its own. But anything that helps is useful in my book. Mm. No, thanks for that. So just a reminder to um, all participants that we've got a quick poll question there and you will see that uh, on your panel. And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll put the, um, not the question specifically, but the general issue about internet coverage. Um, and how do you think that, uh, and I think you mentioned Mongolia um, as well as South Korea, sort of uh, slightly different countries, but um, how does it play out, I suppose, when you, in your thinking about this and how we should be thinking about this in terms of the impact of this pandemic and change in campaigning and its impact on political freedoms? Yeah. Um, can you summarize the question again? Just uh... Yeah, so I suppose it's really, um, I suppose, I suppose actually there are, few, there are a few parts of this question. I suppose if, if in fact we've got a country where there's low internet coverage, mm. what, are we, what are we tending to see in terms of the shift in campaigning as opposed to a country where there's high, much high, um, high levels of internet coverage? Mm. And the other prong, the other aspect to it is that, well, what is then the varying impact on political freedoms? Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I suppose one of the big question marks that, 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 that hangs over the Mongolian case study for me is, is how accurate are the reports of social media um, making uh, much of difference um, in the Mongolian elections? So, you know, it can look really good. You can look at Twitter and see a whole load of activity going on, but statistically it might make very little difference. So, so I wonder how much of the, the reports about the impact of social media in Mongolia are anecdotal, impressionistic, um, and how much there is actually data there to support the claims that social media has been sort of useful because it's a very interesting case study. It's understudied, um, but I think we need we would need answers to those questions to sort of fill in the gaps. Because mm -hmm. I always worry, and we were talking about this uh, this uh, just just recently, Ju Chang. Um, I always worry that there can be a very um, excessively positive view given of any use of technology, um, mm -hmm. and. And sometimes it is based more on a sort of faith in technology than mm. the actual facts. Um, so, so I'm just really interested. I, I, I just simply don't know. And, uh, and I would be really interested to know whether um, 
whether it, it re really is just sort of limited to the city areas and or, or even that. Um, but in terms of political freedoms, I think there's an extra issue here. And this is one of the things I picked up but didn't elaborate on when I was giving my list of challenges faced during um, elections uh, organized under pandemic conditions. And that is, if you have a situation where some people have good internet access in among the population and others don't at all, is there a political equality issue going on there if campaigning shifts very wholesale to online? Yeah. You know, what if some people simply don't have access to that public forum, that public sphere, which has been effectively digitized? Yeah. Um, I think that's a big issue. And I think that's a big issue that really becomes more and more important the lower the number of the percentage of internet access in a, in a country is. And I think yeah. that's something I would like to tease out and discuss a little bit more as well. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a, it's a, and I think unpacking is really important. And it, I mean, your comments connect to a question that uh, Michael Yusinko has put is whether higher strong presence in social media um, can translate to electoral victory. And um, I'll get your response to that, but it just occurred to me, I mean, just reflecting on your, um, your answer is that it depends what we mean by the use of social media, right? I mean, there's the use of social media that's affordable. You know, you set up a Facebook account, you send up some sub record of video, or there's a use of social media the way that Cambridge Analytica engage in, which was mm -hmm. basically compile a big database um, targeted people with personalized messages and so on and so forth. And we're talking about big money there on the second hand, but we're talking about, you know, much more leveling in terms of the, on, on the first hand. And I'll, I'll be keen to know from, because we've got a wealth of expertise, of course, among the participants and a lot of you would know about your country context much more. And I, so I say there's no, no, no poor reflection you Tom, but much more in terms of this particular question than uh, Tom and I would that please um, com make your contributions. What do you see in terms of the use of social media? You know, I think that is a question that would be key for us answering what the impact of online campaigning uh, is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I think that's, that's really important as well. As you said, it's about unpacking some of these questions. And I think we need to disaggregate exactly what we mean by social media. Absolutely. Because um, different channels are used in different ways in different countries. I mean, WhatsApp has been the primary sort of channel for misinformation in India, as I as I understand it. In Brazil, it's Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, um, different apps have different coverage. You know, um, some far right groups are making much more use now of Telegram than 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 other other channels. So it, it depends. Um, and it depends on sort of how the social media are being used. In some cases, you know, it's um, not clear where a message originated. Yeah. In others, you can actually see the chains. Some are private, like WhatsApp, yeah. or, or more closed. Others are more public, like Facebook. So, so it really depends. But one of the things that I sort of would return to again and again is we have a tendency to sort of um, mistake techno sophisticates for Democrats. You know, mm -hmm. what we actually see around the world today is some of the most sophisticated users of technology to to to, to distort the democratic public sphere or the or public discussions yep. are anti-democratic. Yeah. So so that is a that is a serious issue. Yeah. I think your answer and in a way corresponds to the um, the answers the participants are given to the first polling question. And the first polling question um, was really about the impact on uh, this change in campaigning techniques on the financing of campaigns and whether uh, this shift has increased the significance sort of, uh, in terms of the problems of the financing of campaigns. And what you'll see, and the participants can see this in terms of the, uh, the polling results, is that we've got a mixed outcome, right? Mm. And a mixed outcome, and and I, uh, I can't read beyond that mixed outcome, but I, I would speculate that it's really about contextual factors mm. uh, that matter in trying to understand uh, the these quiz questions. Yeah, any comments you want to make about these uh, poll polling results, uh, Tom? Anything that struck you? 
I mean, I, I, I think it just, it's, it's, uh, it tallies with my own intuition, let's put it this way, yeah. um, about, I have mixed feelings myself yeah. about online campaigning. And I, I think, I think one of the useful, uh, really useful sort of um, uh, takeaways from this poll is what we will probably see and what we need to guard against is that, for example, the South Korea example becomes totemic and there is an expectation that you can simply replicate it. Um, yeah. And that the online campaigning is seen as, as uh, inevitably a good. And I think we just need to be very balanced and to really sort of be very clear about what are the potential disadvantages as well as the advantages as we're building our knowledge base and building our sort of regional sort of knowledge base for the future, because this issue isn't going to go away. Even outside of pandemic times, yeah. online campaigning is here to stay. Um, it's just going to be a question of degree. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, I've just been advised uh, that uh, the Facebook uh, listeners, and uh, thanks all for coming through Facebook, can't see the polling results. So my apologies for assuming that's the case. But uh, uh, what we have in terms of the question, which was really about the um, the impact on this shift in campaigning uh, in the pandemic on finance, uh, whether that's resulted in greater difficulties in terms of financing of campaigns and political parties. And we've got yes, nine out of 41, uh, no, eight out of 41, and another eight out of 41 um, somewhat. So really quite, quite mixed, really, quite mixed, really. Um, sorry, I lost my... Um, my train of thought kind of thing. Yes, uh, the, the question I had was this actually, um, and it, it, it goes to, I suppose, the point you made about sort of trying to fetishize or trying to valorize this online or social media space, because when we think about distant campaigning, of course, it's something that's been in existence for decades now, and in fact, are still used to quite effective use. So think about television ads, Radio mm -hmm. ads, newspapers, um, you know, uh, bollard posters, and so on and so forth. Um, do you get any sense from the, the the research you've done that, in fact, the uh, the shift is, and maybe, uh, and again, maybe it depends on the, of course, the context of whether there's wide internet coverage or, or low internet coverage, whether there has been more of a shift in terms of those other forms of campaigning, distant campaigning, uh, rather than you know, social media and internet and so on. Yeah, I think I think um, so. I don't have um, a, a lot of data on that um, from the research, but I think one of the things that's actually contained in your question is I think st it does come back to that issue of what is the internet access in a given country. I think it also, once again, th thinking about disaggregating this question, um, I think it depends on who a given party uh, has as their base. You know, who's your audience? Who are you really trying to target? And that might really change, shift the dial on how much you're going to embrace online campaigning. Because if you are speaking or if you're targeting, if your base is a much older demographic, um, yeah. perhaps you don't see the need. Um, whereas, you know, I think um, it, it's just going to be very different from from state to state. I mean, we see the the push in Malaysia at the moment, for example, towards a new youth party. Mm. Now, that kind of party is probably going to be very eager to embrace online campaigning, um, yeah. but it would be very different to the parent party that perhaps it broke away from. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think it really depends on what's the party and who's the audience. Yeah, yeah. So we have another question, really, whether um, if you know the shift to distance and uh, online campaigning, um, its impact on election-related physical violence, mm. yeah, um, and whether that is a really a, a positive upside um, in terms of this uh, change. Yeah, I mean, once again, I haven't seen any sort of clear data on this in the in the information we've been gathering. Um, but you would expect that the the less people are in physical contact or proximity, that the less capacity or, or, or potential there is for 
for violence. Um, but at the same time, sort of returning to the WHO's, WHO's warning back in April, we have this infodemic. And the infodemic is not only about um, the intensification of fake news and rumors about the, about the pandemic itself, it's about scapegoating particular communities. Um, so, you know, uh, minority communities have been sort of um, criticized as not um, not complying with physical distancing, for example, in some states, um, you know, the Muslim community in India, for example, it hasn't been in an election context, um, but you can really see how that intensification of um, sort of hate speech, essentially, um, could really um, make things quite difficult um, during an election period when you do have this febrile uh, context, you have this highly charged political atmosphere and when you have that sort of, you know, that scapegoating. Um, so, so I think once again, it's sort of, um, it's, it's a, it's an issue with two sides. Um, yeah. and, and, and I can see how I, I would just be waiting on more data to see, to see what's actually happening on the ground. And I'd be re interested to hear anything, even anecdotal from our audience about that issue. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on that? I mean, this is, uh, as, of course, of quite a vexed question about how do you regulate hate speech? I mean, it, it clearly has um, an adverse impact in terms of integrity of elections, in terms of accurate, it depends on accurate information. Uh, it clearly has an adverse impact uh, when directed at particular groups on equality. Uh, on the other hand, there's, you know, free speech considerations and also the fear that, you know, that the incumbent uh, party would actually abuse whatever powers are, are given to regulate speech mm. to enhance its competitive advantage. So I suppose, uh, or drawing all those thoughts together, I suppose just getting your sense of what, I mean, what would you think would be good mechanisms that kind of balance this complex set of considerations, which might, an issue might be growing significance given this shift to um, online campaigning. Yeah, it's an extraordinarily difficult one. I mean, we all know that, for example, social media platforms have been very resistant to the very idea of uh, regulating um, speech on their platforms. Um, the general tendency is to sort of cleave to a view of freedom as the absence of regulation. And we saw that in Mark Zuckerberg's um, Georgetown University address some time ago, a very simplistic sort of view of freedom, but clearly a view of freedom that aligns with their um, their economic interests, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. The issue of regulation itself is extraordinarily problematic, especially when you think about it in the context of uh, a, a government that might seek to suppress free speech. So, by way of example, outside of the region uh, of Asia and the Pacific, in Brazil right now, there's a fake news bill that was passed by the Senate in July, and it seeks to make social platforms uh, responsible for anything contained on their platforms. And, um, uh, and, to, and to, they're required to record chains of communication um, and so on. And there's been real concerns raised about how this will have a chilling effect where social platforms will be so worried about falling foul of this law that they'll actually engage in very widespread excessive censorship themselves at mm. source. Um, mm. so, so you have this strange situation um, where between government and citizen, you have this intermediary, the, 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 the tech giants, and, um, and they are very reluctant to regulate um, when there is some sort of regulation needed, but also yeah. there is clearly the capacity for them to overregulate if law is overly broad, if law is not not carefully designed. So yeah. I don't think anybody has the right answer to this question yet, and I think it's one of the sort of million dollar questions for yeah. for the coming years. Yeah, yeah.
Thanks for that, Tom. Um, just to draw attention to the uh, outcomes of the second question, which uh, really connected to the uh, issue that we discussed a few moments ago, whether a high or strong presence in social media can translate into electoral victory. And again, we've got a mixed outcome, right? I mean, we've got op the people have answered. Uh, a third have said yes. A another third have said no. And another third have said maybe. So um, I don't know whether you want to add any further comments on that, Tom, or, or, or if so. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting. I mean, it's, um, I think it just shows how much this issue that we're discussing is a moving target. You know, not only are, are we all trying to sort of keep up with the facts of what's actually happened on the ground in multiple contexts, multiple countries. And we've limited, limited uh, information because of things like language uh, barriers, but we're also, it's a mo moving target because um, we haven't made our own minds up about um, the principled position from which we yeah. would assess these questions. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's sort of, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really difficult to, to pin down, but I suppose this is what this lecture series is doing, right? It's a it's, yeah. it's helping to start pinning it down. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you again, I suppose coming back to this question about path dependence and disruption, right? So, I mean, we're in the middle of pandemic uh, and really until a vaccine is found, it's hard, to, you know, the, the, we can see things can continue. But, say um, optimistically you know we're, we're told that perhaps maybe a vaccine will be found by by the end of the year and there might be wide respect take up um and i'm asking you to um gaze in your crystal ball tom i mean um, reflecting on your expertise thinking about democratic decay over a longer period of time mm. it's like let's say we're having this seminar in two years time how will we reflect upon this experience now in the middle of a pandemic? Will we see this as a, uh, again, uh, just a bump, and then we went on doing th things that we did before the pandemic? Or um, do you perhaps seeing some kind of more fundamental reconfiguration? And again, I know this is Chris Paul gazing, but I think that's, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think now is the time that we need to do some considered crystal ball gazing. Um, because really, to a certain extent, known for some time, for example, that technology is not going to be our savior. In fact, it might be the opposite. Um, and that has been slowly dawning on us. It's really easy to forget that, you know, Twitter only appeared in 2006, Facebook 2004, um, you know, <laughs> social media and smartphones only in 2007. So they've only been with us for a decade, decade and a half, um, but they've completely transformed um, how we live, how we work, and now how we campaign and run elections increasingly. Um, but I think what the pandemic has done is it's sort of crystallized that we're facing two potential futures. One is a future where we have sort of normalized surveillance, where we have sort of um, we have the, the 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 broad use of technology to sort of track individuals to um, to 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 just mine them for everything, both commercially and politically, that you can. We have micro targeting. We have the echo chambers being sort of uh, developed through social media. Um, we have misinformation so prevalent that the idea of a shared public forum has just completely fragmented. You know, we're in different realities. And that's one of the futures that we're looking at where that becomes the sort of the norm. It becomes normalized. We start to forget what it was like before. But what we're also seeing, and this is one of the reasons why we set up the COVID Dem project, which was, was, to, was to not just sort of collate information on all of these threats and this really unappealing vista, but also to put together information on the, the, the signs of hope and what we're seeing as well. And this is why I sort of wanted to give some, you know, decent attention to the South Korean story um, mm. is that technology is value neutral, like online campaigning is to a certain extent value neutral. It's a tool and it depends on how we use it. Mm. Um, so that brings us back to, you know, the very useful question of agency. We still have agency here. We're not just victims 
of tectonic trends. It seems like that very often. And when we're really struggling to crack the nut of how to regulate social media and so on, both in terms of hate speech specifically, but misinformation more widely, it seems sometimes like we're very far away from an answer. Mm. But I think as, as long as we sort of focus on the future we don't want, even that is a, is, is a good place to start because then we can start constructing from there. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, that there are, there are many different ways of, of making technology work. I mean, Taiwan has shown that you can have a crowdsourced, open sourced, uh, diffuse, decentralized, democratic response to the pandemic. It's not in the context of elections, but I can completely see how it could really work during an election campaign, you know, the use of online bulletin boards, the sharing of information. Um, it's really a, just a world away from the, the, the concentration of executive power um, that we've seen in many states during the election, and that has distorted the election campaigns in a, no, a number of states as well. So, so I always hold to hope, and I think um, we, can still, we can still sort of see a different way forward. Yeah. I'll wrap up on this question, Tom. And uh, but before I do that, just to there's a, a last polling, uh, snap polling question um, that I encourage participants to sort of answer on whether they think internet access is too low in your country for online campaigns to be effective. I suppose even before the pandemic, people were talking about post democracy. They're talking mm -hmm. about declining trust in government, uh, low levels of engagement um, in terms of political process. So. Really, a, a, a broad because and why that's clearly relevant to the topic uh, at hand is, of course, political freedoms are not just formal freedoms. I mean, I always think democracy is a contact sport. Mm -hmm. You need to mm -hmm. be engaged in it, right? So, again, just sort of real broad views about whether you know this pandemic, the changes in the campaigning, what impact do you think would have on the levels and intensity of political engagement? And another big question, and again, feel free to ignore it, is whether what do you think that might do in terms of trust in government? Yeah, it's a really important question once again. And um, it's one of these difficult questions because we have to ask ourselves once again, what do we want engagement to look like? Because we, we're still very wedded to the types of indicators that we traditionally would look to for engagement, party membership voting numbers, turnout, you know, sort of um, those kinds of indicators. Um, mm. But if you start looking elsewhere, um, you start seeing that there is engagement, but engagement itself is changing. So, for example, um, the change.org um, have released this poll, this global, this global um, survey, which shows that uh, there's been an 81 percent increase in people um, actually filling out online petitions, signing online petitions during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And one of the hotspots for a huge increase, a very significant increase in online campaigning is South Africa, where, yeah. you know, for the last few years, the narrative has been there's decline, decline, decline. People are turning away and they're yeah. being turned off by politics. So I think, you know, we're going to have to broaden our indicators of what we think political engagement looks like. But I think we also have to return to the real traditional, because if anything, the pandemic has shown us is that we're social animals. It is a contact sport. It's a physical sport. You know, we need to be physically in spaces together yeah. to be able to have what is a public sphere that feels like a human community. It cannot yeah. simply be displaced and it can't be digitized. It can't be put into the digital sphere. So I think, you know, online campaigning is very useful, but we have to think of it as a, a, a useful additional tool. I don't think it's ever going to displace, you know, yeah. in-person sort of contact. No worries. Okay. Any other final comments, Tom, before um, we wrap up the event and, and I'll, I'll begin the uh, uh, formalities and ending it? Well, I mean, all I'll say is, um, the information on COVID Dem was provided at the start, and I'm happy to provide it again, maybe as a comment on the Facebook page, or maybe it can be sent out to the uh, uh, audience afterwards. 
But we really welcome, um, you know, any information that people have on how the pandemic is affecting democracy, quite, quite broadly construed. So do feel free to email us. It's coviddem at gmail.com. And, um, and, and, you know, we're, it would be great to sort of feed your information into our database because then it's available to everyone. Fantastic, Tom. That was really excellent. And um, I, I really enjoyed the presentation and exchange. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak on behalf of participants uh, who actually did so. Um, before I end uh, by saying thank you, just a reminder that in two weeks' time, we'll have uh, Therese uh, Pierce and Anella speaking about special voting arrangements. And I'm going to engage in a bit of self promotion. In four weeks' time, uh, um, I'll be giving a lecture that pairs up in a way with Tom's lecture. And but this time, looking about the in the shift in campaigning and its impact on the funding election campaigns and political parties. And I think that was a particular issue that we touched upon a little bit and it was raised an issue, but then we'll be taking up in uh, much more systematically. Um, after this event has com uh, been completed, there will be an evaluation survey that um, uh, uh, please, um, you know, it'd be great if you could actually complete it uh, because your feedback is actually quite important in terms of us organizing the series of events and particularly its qualities. So let me thank by uh, end the lecture by thanking Tom uh, for a presentation and the paper, the various participants uh, through WebEx as well as Facebook. Um, the various uh, international idea, the primary organizer and the prime uh, prime mover of this uh, of this um, event, and the various friends that supported the event. We've got a evaluation survey. Sorry, this is my oversight. We also have a um, post lecture survey. Yeah, the questions of which are now on the bottom right of your corner. Um, so. I'll encourage you to fill them up and thank you very much. I, I thank think you everyone. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chi Chang. Thank you.